On today's video, I am cooking 100 years of finger food. We're gonna be rating them from one to 10, so you know which one is best. And we're starting off with this one. What the <laughs> heck is that? That looks insane. Welcome to the 1910s. Finger foods are one of the most popular things every country has in common. It is a delicious food, we all love it, and some are so iconic that it defines their country. I can guarantee even cavemen had their own variation of finger food. In the 1910s, this was quite popular. And it all starts with this, chicken breast. Unlike nowadays where we deep fry chicken, in this decade, to make this finger food, we have to boil it and make sure to season it really good with salt and pepper. As once it's fully cooked, you want to go ahead and shred the whole thing. Once that's done, you want to get a nice container oiled up. First, you add all of your chicken, followed by a good amount of carrots, peas, and to finish it off, you want to add some gelatin. The key here is to make sure that you add enough so that you cover the whole thing. Then after about one hour in the refrigerator, carefully try to remove your mold. It's gonna be quite tricky, so for that, heat up the edges with a torch. And in the end, you should be left with this. Now you tell me, what do you think? Does it look appetizing to you? Is this finger food absolutely insane? Because I'm pretty sure other decades are way better. However, I cannot wait to taste history and see how this one stacks up. And there we have it, guys. What do you think? What the heck is that? <laughs> this is actually quite fancy. I'm excited. I'm really excited for this one. Fancy? And obviously, I made a humongous one. Usually, it was tiny, just like these two for you guys. So I only made two little ones and one big one. Dig in. Let's go. <laughs> it feels disgusting. Grab, grab your... Yeah, he's always served with a little plate. <laughs> Google, it's actually... It's gross. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, Leo? That looks amazing. It's a work of art. Maybe for a third grader, because this is not no Picasso. This is, it's, it's cold, it's slimy, it's- Don't worry, as a matter of fact, Picasso is coming real soon. Enough talking, let's give this a try. You ready? Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Mm. <laughs> mm -mm. I think you guys are thrown off by the texture. 100%. Wow, really, is that bad? I'm not a, not a big fan. I'm sorry, Google, that tastes horrible. <laughs> it's like chicken jello. The flavor is on point. The flavor is good, it's the texture it's, thing. It's definitely a texture thing. I agree with you guys, but the next decade is a whole nother level. In 1920s, taquitos were created. It was sold in a Mexican restaurant in California. Another finger food that became extremely popular in Japan was this, okonomiyaki. Some call it Japanese pancake. And surprisingly, it's not that hard to make. Everything starts off with a batter. Into a bowl, throw in all-purpose flour, followed by baking powder and dashi. Now you want to mix it well until you get a batter consistency just like this. Next up, beat up some eggs and add them to the batter. Now you want to add the vegetables. First, some chopped up cabbage, followed by tempura flakes, some octopus as meat, and to finish it off, some scallions. Mix everything well and combine these ingredients together. So after adding a good amount of oil to the pan, immediately add in the batter mix. Make sure to be generous with it. And please notice one important thing. It is under very low heat. To start cooking it evenly, go ahead and cover it up. And after about 10 minutes, remove the lid and add in some bacon. Once you notice that it's lightly golden brown, with one motion, go ahead and flip the whole thing. Take a look at the color. That's what you're looking for. Once the second side is also cooked up, you want to go ahead and set it on a plate and add some okonomi sauce. By the way, you can find this sauce in any Asian supermarket. If not, you could always get it online. Because to finish this up, you want to go ahead and add a generous amount of QP mayo. Make sure to make a nice, beautiful design. As in the end, throw in some bonito flakes, followed by scallions and some hot pepper. Okonomiyaki. It looks phenomenal. But does it taste as good as it looks? And there we have the 1920s. What do you guys think, huh? That looks a lot better than the last thing we ate. <laughs> Way better. <laughs> dig in. Please, dig in. That's a big upgrade. I know. <laughs> Enough talking. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Huh? Mm-hmm. This is the <laughs> Is there octopus in there? Yeah. I love this type of cuisine. I love this pancake. It's just got so much going on. The sauce, the octopus, the seafood flavor. You have a bunch of vegetables in there that are very filling, taste great. Everything is amazing about it. Apparently, you really like the Rosa Bashan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have nothing to say. It's just great. <laughs> so you guys approve? 100%. The seafood and the sauces together, it's I have no words. It's just amazing. I don't know. <laughs> 
I am very happy that you guys enjoyed this one right here because the next decade is gonna be completely different. In 1930s, Twinkies were created and sold all over the US, and the very first sneaker bar was manufactured in Chicago. Both were sold for 5 cents. Times were hard. It was the Great Depression. Since meat was expensive, mushroom was a good replacement. For this creative finger food, you want to start by preparing the mushrooms. In a skillet, add in some oil followed by onions and garlic. Saute that for a little bit and as soon as you start getting some color, add in the mushrooms. The key here is to cook them until they are nicely golden brown. In the end, take a look. The next thing you gotta use is this, the good old sandwich bread. But you gotta be a little creative. So you wanna chop up the ends, then cut them in triangles. But this has two variations. The first was for the last fortunate. You wanna go ahead and toast the bread, add that to a plate, and add a good amount of the mushrooms you just cooked. To finish it off, just add some parsley, followed by salt. Now this is the inexpensive version. For the wealthy, they were able to add something extra. Chicken liver. This was quite popular back then. To cook it, it's super simple. A little bit of salt followed by freshly ground black pepper. Quickly saute into the pan. Once you got a nice good color, let it rest for about two minutes, slice that up, and start building your finger food. The same exact way we did previously. But to top it off, you add one slice of chicken liver on top. Because in the end, you are left with this. You tell me which one would you rather have? The one without the chicken liver or the one with it? And here we have the 1930s, which was the time of depression. Now, if you didn't have enough money, what are you doing? I'm trying to wake up from this nightmare and go, and go back to <laughs> the last one. If you didn't have enough money, you would eat this one here. But if you are upper class and you had a little bit more money to spare, you would eat this one here. Fancy. <laughs> I want you guys to choose your own. So go ahead. And, oh, damn, Leo, that was quick. <laughs> I'll go for the fancy one. Okay, the fancy version. Very good. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Mmm. No, this is phenomenal. I'm telling you. What do you think? You're the fancy guy. I can't taste the liver. I mean, the kid. <laughs> you can't taste the liver? What do you mean? Then not at all? There's so much mushroom that it's, it's overpowering the liver because it's too much. <laughs> it almost tastes like there's meat on top of the cracker because of that mushroom density. Forget the liver. I don't need the liver. Try the liver by the, itself. Nah, we want to know. No, no, I'm okay. Little piece. Little piece. Try to be rich at once. You know what? Actually, not that bad. I'm telling you, it's not bad at all. Okay. There you go, everybody. Goes to show you try something new. You never know how it's going to taste. But now, let's jump on to the next one. In the 40s, surprisingly, pizza was not as popular as it is nowadays. Pizzerias in Brooklyn, New York were not going to let any dough go to waste. So this magical thing was created. Garlic knots. Another fantastic invention was nachos. It was originally created because the owner of a restaurant couldn't find a cook. So he quickly went back in the kitchen, found some tortilla, cut that up, and fried them. Once that was done, he added shredded cheese, heated that in the oven real quick, but he was not satisfied fight yet. He threw in some sauce, which he quickly put it together using a simple hand blender, added some sliced jalapenos, and served it to the guests. Now this was the original's nachos. Now you tell me, what would you think if you get nachos like this nowadays? It's not the most appetizing, and it doesn't come even close to what we have nowadays. First, you gotta get a mountain of chips. Then you wanna add a generous amount of cheese. Then you can't forget about the beans, pico de gallo, guacamole, pico de jalapenos, and in the and you are left with this monstrosity. And here we have the 1940s. What do you guys think, huh? I think one looks a lot better than the other. Well, here's the deal, okay? This is where we started, and here's what we have today. And I'm very curious to find out which one you guys are gonna go for. Uh, you don't mind. <laughs> it's close to me, so I'll go for this one, you know? You guys go for the monster version. I'll take the original version. The, the ones that were made during your time. Fine, Leo, fine, fine, fine. This one is just a little bit sad, everybody. Uh, Sebastian's gonna double oh. dip. I don't mind, I don't blame you. Enough talking. Here goes the nachos, everybody. Cheers. 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 I mean, this one is just whatever. How's this one? I cannot wait to find the out. The is amazing. <laughs> it's so good. The cheese, the tomatoes, the onions. I even had some tomatoes fall on my shirt, bro. If you're eating nachos and you don't get dirty, you're not eating nachos right. In the 1950s, pigs in a blanket became more popular than ever. And another finger food that came to life was French dip. It's an American classic. And in Canada, its national dish finally came to life. 
poutine. In its original form, poutine is quite simple to make. Because trust me, there are several different other variations out there. But let's start with the original. First, you want to make some french fries. You want to go ahead and fry them twice. First, on a low temperature oil at about 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Once they're fully cooked, you want to remove it from the oil and let them cool down. Because now we're going in for the crisp. Set the oil at 375 degrees Fahrenheit. Throw them in there and cook them up until they're nice and crispy. In the end, you should be left with this. Take a look. Now, to finish up this dish, you gotta add two other elements. The first one is cheese curd. It's similar to fresh mozzarella but slightly different. But if you can't find it, you can definitely use fresh mozzarella. As the next most important thing is the gravy. Add in some oil to a pan, then throw in onion, carrots, and garlic. Cook that up for a little bit. Once you start getting a nice beautiful color, go ahead and add a good quality chicken broth and bring everything to a simmer. After about 10 minutes simmering down, you want to go ahead and strain the whole thing, as in the end you should be with a nice flavorful broth. Now to thicken this up, add a good amount of butter to a pan. Once it's fully melted, go ahead and add some flour and make sure to cook the flour up. Once it starts smelling like pie dough, add that beautiful broth you just made. Whisk it until everything combines together, as in the end, you want to add some Worcestershire sauce, mix that up really good, and you are left with this. Now all there's left to do is to add that to the fries and the cheese curd, and there you have it. Canada's national dish. Poutine, straight up from the 1950s. Poutine? Yes! Where you're from Canada, what do you think? My, my heart's starting to race a little bit. What do you mean, Leo? I was born in Canada, but I've never in my life tried poutine. What? So I'm gonna take your virginity today from poutine? I yeah! <laughs> Let's go! You had it before? Actually, I've never had it. Two poutine time. versions, let's go. <laughs> Stop saying that, man. What do you mean? I cannot wait to find out how you guys think about this. Enough talking, let's give it a go. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. That's good. <laughs> good. <laughs> what I'm shocked about is like the gravy with fries. Yeah, I know. To right? me, it just, it doesn't make sense. The combination of French fries and gravy is so strange, but it works so beautifully. Plus you have that cheese curd that's nice and gooey and stringy, also freaking delicious, and to boot, it's from my country. <laughs> Give it a try, you're not gonna regret it. In the 60s, this not so popular finger food was created. It is fried pickles. Most people are not a fan, but when this one came out in the 60s, it was an instant hit. Tostinos, maybe one of the most well-known finger food in the US. You just gotta stick it in the microwave, heat it up for a little bit, and in the end you're left with this. Basically heat up dough with pizza sauce in the middle and a tiny bit of mozzarella. It's as simple as that. I'm gonna give my best shot on my version of it. So first into a bowl I combine some pepperoni, mozzarella, and pizza sauce. Mix everything well and that's your mix. It doesn't get any easier than that. Now for the dough there are so many different options. You can use pre-made dough from the supermarket, but I decided to give something else a try, which will be this, wonton wrappers. I think they're gonna give an incredible crunch. And to put it together, it's quite simple. Give it a nice egg wash, add the topping right in the middle, close it up nice and tight, and fry everything up at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Once it's nice golden brown, remove it from the oil, and then plate it up. I'll tell you one thing, these don't look like no Tostitos, but I have a feeling they're actually gonna be a lot better. I'm a little bit skeptical, but we're gonna give it a go and see how it actually tastes. And here we have the 1960s Totinos, everybody. Nah, nah. What do you mean, nah? My childhood was based off Totinos. That's not a pizza roll. Why is that bubbly? Why are you laughing, Sebastian? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'm sorry. What is that, Google? <laughs> That's not Totino. I agree, everybody. This one gave me a real hard time. It does not look right. It doesn't feel right. Let's give it a go. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. That's good. Feel better now, Sebastian. Mm. You're going to have your eyes closed coming back to memory. Or... It tastes like a pizza. <laughs> tastes like a pizza. That tastes better than a pizza roll that I had. The pizza rolls that I grew up on, that tastes a lot back better. Back in the 60s, right? OK. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you see, this guy's a little bit shy, bro. I'll tell you one thing, everybody. Obviously, I didn't get this one right, and I agree with you guys. It looks slightly different. You guys saw the original product, but I'll tell you one thing. The next decade, I am an expert at it, and I'm telling you right now, it's going to be perfect.
The American corn dog, it was invented in the 1930s and most people are very familiar with it. But in the late 70s, Korean corn dog was created and became a sensation. Surprisingly, to make it, it is not that difficult. The first thing you gotta do is to make a dough. So into a bowl, I threw in some bread flour, followed by sugar and a good amount of salt. Whisk that up real good and my dry mix was ready. For the yeast, you just wanna combine that with some room temperature water. Mix everything well so that you can activate the instant yeast, then combine the whole thing with the dry mix. You just want to whisk it up real good in a bowl until you have no more dry mix. Then you can immediately put it on a tray just like this, as the next thing to do is to let the whole thing rise. You can stretch out the edges, but really that's not even necessary, as the important thing is to cover it up after about two hours. Take a look. The dough has risen nicely, and it is ready to become Korean corn dog. Now there are several different types of variation. You can just use the hot dog by itself or mozzarella cheese. And the most important thing I highly recommend is using a chopstick. So first I gave it a try to just a regular hot dog, then of course only cheese, but probably my favorite one is the best of both worlds. Now the technique of putting the dough on the dog is quite simple. You just gotta touch it and roll like this. It's that simple. Once that's done, you wanna immediately go in in some panko. Make sure to repeat the process with all different variations, as now once you have everything ready, all you have to do is to fry them up. The important thing here is to make sure you cook the dough. So I like to fry them at 335 degrees Fahrenheit. Once once you've got a nice golden brown color on one side, flip to the next. Keep doing so until they are fully golden brown. As once it's done, take a look. This is what you should be left with. In Korea, a lot of people like to put powdered sugar right on top. And the most common condiment is ketchup and mustard. Because in the end, take a look. Korean corn dog. It is very different than what we have here in the US. And at least to me, a lot better. But let's find out how it actually stacks up. And there we have the 1970s. What do you guys think, Jalavan? That is probably the most appealing one we have yet <laughs> compared to all the other ones. Yeah, I agree. It looks so good, everybody. <laughs> Dig in. I'll take the smaller one, oh, Leo. You guys leave me the big one? I know okay. you like the big dog. <laughs> one bite. <laughs> one bite. <laughs> one bite. <laughs> Enough talking. Let's give it a go. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Mm, I got the uh, cheese. I got all cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I got the hot dog. Mm. You got all cheese? Let's see it. Check the bottom. Okay. Ah, we're, we're getting there. We're you getting got there. the hot dog on the bottom. I think I got, I just got all dog. This is so good. It's so crispy on the exterior, yet the inside is nice and fluffy. Highly recommend you guys giving this a try. You won't regret it, but the next decade might be very familiar to all of you. In the 1980s, Cool Ranch chips took the snack world by storm. And also, Outback Steakhouse opened its doors. They served steaks with side dishes and appetizers. And the most iconic one of them all was Blooming Onion. This might be the most popular appetizer in Outback. And the best part is that you can make this at home. Let me show you. The first thing you need is an onion. Cut out the top first, then lay it down on the cutting board. And from the top down, just cut it as thin or as thick as you like. Because once you flip the upside again, take a look. The iconic blooming onion shape. Now into a bowl, combine some milk, followed by eggs. Whisk that up real good and set aside. Now for the flour, we just gotta season it. I started with all-purpose flour, followed by MSG, salt, garlic powder, and of course, black pepper. Whisk that up until everything is fully combined. As first, you wanna coat the onion with a good amount of that dry mix. Once that's done, go right into the wet mix and go back to the dry one and make sure that every single one of them is fully coated. In the end, you should be left with something like this. To fry it, you wanna do it at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Once everything is nicely golden brown, your blooming onion is ready. All there's left to do is to serve it in a plate and don't forget a nice spicy mayo. Now the question is, this was so delicious that I couldn't help myself from eating it. I'm just wondering if my guys will actually notice. And there we have the 1980s blooming onion. What do you guys think? <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> you guys gotta remember, I gotta get the shot for the video. Are you guys making fun of me already? You said this is supposed to be a blooming onion? Yes! No, no, this looks like you already gave it to a table, they ate it, and then this is their leftovers. <laughs> Pretty much what happened. But they are watching it beautifully on the camera. I wish I was eating it beautifully <laughs> on, on the camera right now. Okay. Missing a few pieces because not only I had to show it to the camera, some others just went to the belly, everybody. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I was like, a few pieces? I got 10% I got of a blooming onion. In here, damn. Well, it's good finger food. I can tell you that right now. Give me your honest opinion in this one, yeah? Okay. Enough talking. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.
I mean, I know what it tastes like because I ate half of the thing already. <laughs> it's amazing, everybody. It's very good. <laughs> it's actually not bad. It's good. I'm glad you guys like this one here because the next one is all from a movie. And I think you guys are going to really enjoy it. In the 90s, KFC came out with the popcorn nuggets. It is still iconic today. One other iconic thing that happened during this decade was the movie Forrest Gump. So many taglines are still being said today. My mom always said, Life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. Yep, Forrest Gump was so popular that they opened up bubblegum shrimp. And one of the most iconic appetizers is this, the hush puppies. And if you've never had it, oh man, you are missing out big time. To make it, it's super simple. Into a bowl, you want to combine all-purpose flour, followed by cornmeal, fully cooked shrimp, any type of white fish, followed by green onions and milk. And of course, you can't forget about the good old Old Bay seasoning, a generous amount. Now you want to mix that up until everything becomes a dough. Just make sure not to add too much milk. You can always add more till you get the consistency like this. Once that's done, the next thing you want to do is go ahead and make some balls. Make sure not to make them too large. If not, the middle will not be fully cooked. Once you have them all ready, fry them up at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. You're looking for a nice golden brown color. But most importantly, make sure that the middle is fully cooked. As in the end, they should be nice and golden brown just like this. Now you can't just eat hush puppies by itself. You definitely need a sauce. Into a bowl, add in some mayo followed by lemon juice and lime zest. Then add some cilantro, some black pepper, and of course some hot sauce. Now mix everything well and your dipping sauce is done. The only thing left to do is to go ahead and plate it up. Now this is Hush Puppies. It is still being served today in every bubblegum shrimp restaurant. And if you've never heard of Hush Puppies, you are not living. And here we have the 1990s straight from Forrest Gump. <laughs> run Forrest, run! <laughs> what do you think, Leah? Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. But what the hell is that? <laughs> Yo, that was a perfect accent. I practice my southern accent every once in a while. Very good. So this is Bubba Gun Shrimp Hush Puppies. And it's extremely popular until today. And I would love to know you guys' opinion. So here's the deal. Grab a little bit of dumpling sauce, go in and just ding right in and let's go for it. You don't have to be polite. Come on now. I was going to say, you sure you don't want to dunk your balls at the same time? <laughs> These guys are always dirty mind, everybody. I don't know what you're talking about, Google. I'm talking about food over mm. here. You sure you're still Canadian? <laughs> I don't know what I am anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Enough talking, let's give it a try. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> yeah, boy. That sauce is fantastic. Mm -hmm. The hush puppies are perfectly fried, crunchy on the outside, and that sauce is so flavorful. It's beautiful with this hush puppy. I would say it's a very good uh, hush puppy, but I just feel the calories. You know what I'm saying? It's just going down. Doctor is not gonna approve this one, everybody. It's fantastic. Give it a try. You're not gonna regret it. In the 2000s, Burger King came out with this, chicken fries. It was supposed to appeal to an adult audience who were okay to spend a little bit more money. It didn't work, so they actually discontinued it. But later, they introduced it once again and came out with different variations. One of them was this, Cheetos chicken fries. They are literally exactly what you think they are. You want to start by using some ground chicken, but make sure to season it properly. First, a good amount of salt, followed by garlic powder, MSG, and white pepper. Mix everything well until it becomes a dough. Next up for the breading, literally Cheetos. You just want to break them up as much as you can until it becomes powder. As once that's done, make sure to oil up your hand real good. Grab a good amount of chicken. Make sure to make a nice long strip. Coat them in Cheetos. Once you got a generous amount, fry them up at 350 degrees Fahrenheit until they are nicely golden brown. Once that's done, you just want to plate them up. Make sure to be generous with it. As in the end, you are left with this. Cheetos chicken fries. I don't know about you but at least to me they actually look very appetizing but do they taste as good as they look well let's find out welcome to the 2000s what do you guys think huh that looks good you look excited yes because it's fried food we, we eat so much crazy stuff man especially on this list we ate a bunch of weird stuff that looks normal it looks delicious are they mozzarella sticks or damn bro you're calling me out mozzarella sticks like this I kind of look like mozzarella sticks. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. It's actually from Burger King. What does it look like that from Burger King? Uh, it's got to be chicken fries. Absolutely. Let's give it a go. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. 
Mm. Wow. I don't know about you guys, but I'm just saying, mine tastes better than Burger King. Burger King could learn a thing or two from these fries, Google. They are so dense and packed with chicken inside, plus that crust on the exterior is perfectly fried. It's crumbly, it's crispy. This is fantastic. What do you think is about dams? I've never heard from Burger King. I've never had chicken fries from Burger what? King, so these are pretty good. Really? Yeah. Is it yeah. your first time? 100%. This is pretty good, everybody, and I cannot wait for you guys to see the next decade. Now, in today's decade, if you love fried chicken, this should be very familiar to you. Chicken and waffles. Originally created in the 1600s, it is a staple of soul food, but the fair took it to a whole nother level by creating this. Just look at it. You can't ignore it. It makes you want to buy it and eat it. Now, what might actually shock you is how easy and simple it is to make it at home. First up, for the chicken, you definitely you want to use chicken compressed because we're gonna fry them up real quick just chop them up in one inch cubes then into a bowl you want to throw in some all-purpose flour followed by baking powder salt garlic powder and black pepper mix that up and that's your dry mix for the wet mix just combine some eggs and milk together whisk that up and now it's ready now throw all of the chicken into the wet mix followed by the dry mix make sure to get them all coated nicely the more you coat them the better as now you want to fry it at 350 degrees Fahrenheit once they got a nice beautiful color just like this they are now ready then you want to get yourself some nice waffle cones to finish them up just add a generous amount of chicken into the waffles and you want to make two sauces the first one is a red spicy one into a bowl combine some Japanese mayo followed by sriracha and some lime juice now whisk that up real well and add some kochujang whisk that up a little bit more and there you have it it's as simple as that for the white sauce start with Japanese mayo followed by garlic salt and black pepper mix that up and your white sauce is ready as the only thing left to do now is to add the beautiful sauces right on top of the chicken and the waffles and of course to finish it up add some greens because I'll tell you one thing the more you do this the more fun it actually is but does it taste as good as it looks and welcome to what we have nowadays what do you guys think that looks wow. amazing huh? it, looks it looks good so beautiful like Picasso himself made that bro well thank you sir well I'm looking forward to see what you guys think grab in dig in now the question is how how will you tackle the situation? Are you gonna grab it like that? Or are you just gonna bite it? You're gonna go in? I wouldn't be Leo if I didn't just dive into this thing. I wanna know how it tastes. Give me your honest opinion. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Mm. You don't need to say anything. Your beard says it all. Better, Liam? Feel better now? Yeah, I feel a lot better now. <laughs> but you had a combination of the waffle too. What do you think? I want to know what it's you guys think. It's so surprising. The combination of the sweet and salty of the fried chicken, the waffle cone, it's its fantastic. It's so, so amazing. And what do you think, Sebastian? I want to know your opinion. This is f***ing good. Damn, Sebastian. <laughs> <laughs> It looks good, it tastes good, but this has got to be the most unhealthy thing on this whole No, we don't life. think about that. Don't worry about that, Leo. And our winner today is? Chicken and waffles. Chicken this and waffles. one, everybody, <laughs> you can't beat it. You will not go wrong with it. Give it a try. We absolutely love it, and it's fantastic. The sweet and the savoriness together is just on a whole nother level. Just don't need too much, though. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, hit that thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, be sure to subscribe. Let us know in the comments down below what 100 years of next food you would like to see next. And we'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Now go make yourself some. Make this one. You're going to really enjoy it. Take care.